A hundred flood warnings are in place across the UK as many homes and communities continue to come to terms with flooding caused by storms Kira and Dennis. Well, we're joined now from central London by the Environment Secretary, George Eustace. Thank you very much for being on the show this morning, uh, Mr morning. Eustace. Hundreds of families are dealing with the devastation uh, of floods. We've seen homes in places like Yorkshire's Calder Valley who've suffered from six floods in the last five years. What reassurances can you give these people on the show this morning that the government has got a grip on the situation? Well, sadly, with climate change, these kinds of extreme weather events are becoming uh, more frequent. We know if you look at the long run trends that weather events like this are increasing uh, uh, in their frequency uh, each year. And all we can really do is try to improve our flood defences and improve our response. So over the last uh, five years, we spent over two and a half billion pounds on uh, over 600 flood projects that's provided protection to over 200,000 homes and there's more to come and while uh, it's been a terrible flood event these last two weeks the, the ground has been waterlogged we've had two consecutive uh, storms and some 2,000 plus homes flooded as a result we have also uh, during that period protected some 50,000 homes with the measures we've taken in the last five years and looking forward we want to do even more so we're committed to spending uh, over four billion pounds on additional flood defences in the next five years. So I can't help thinking the government talks a good game when it comes to flood defences. But just to pick up on the £2.5 billion funding that you've been talking about uh, that was introduced from 2015, up to 60% of that is going to be spent around London rather than in places like Yorkshire, which are suffering. And that is because flood defence uh, spending, the formula for it, uh, is dependent on property prices. So, of course, as a result, disproportionately benefits homes in the South East. How can that be fair? Well, I don't really think that's right. We, uh, we are direct our uh, flood defence spending to areas that are at uh, greatest risk and where the money will protect the greatest number of homes. That does mean that some of the big projects tend to be in our urban areas. But it's important to note that around 25% uh, of all our flood spending has gone to Yorkshire. Uh, that's in recognition of the fact uh, that Yorkshire is uh, at risk of flooding. And indeed, last weekend I visited York uh, and I saw the Foss Barrier and there's been some significant investment uh, in that in order to improve its capacity in the last five years. So I don't accept uh, that we're not investing in other uh, areas, but there's always more that um, we want to do. And that's why in the next five years, we're going to be spending even more uh, on flood defences and crucially as well, looking at uh, nature based solutions. So moving upstream to try to slow uh, the flow of water down to our urban areas in the first place, using dams and trees and natural floodplains and the like. So just to clarify, you're saying that it's incorrect to say that property prices uh, help to determine the flood defence formula spending? Well, uh, my understanding is the formula that um, is applied uh, by um, the Environment Agency is looking at the number of homes that can be protected from a given scheme. And um, uh, that is why it is uh, understandable that your hard defences in urban areas uh, will tend to be in your larger centres of population because an investment there will protect the greatest number of homes. Uh, but it's not universally uh, the case. And um, it, Yorkshire has been a big recipient of uh, defence spending. York alone, we've uh, been spending around £70 million to provide uh, protections uh, in the city of York and indeed upstream. You can see why though some people outside of London uh, would feel that if this was happening in London, in some of these big cities, uh, closer to the politicians in Westminster, more would be done. I mean, where is the Prime Minister this week? Well, look, uh, when I was appointed uh, um, a week ago on Thursday, um, the Prime Minister, when he met me, the first thing he said is there are some storms coming up. Storm Dennis is coming this weekend. We know the impacts are going to be... Uh, what action we would take. It was agreed uh, that I uh, would make a, a visit uh, to look at our preparedness over that weekend. It's not true that the Prime Minister's uh, not been engaged in this. Um, from the very moment he appointed me, he's been engaged. Um, we stood up our uh, National Flood Response Centre and there have been daily conference calls that I've led. And you know, in a Cabinet government, it's not a, a one-man show. Uh, it's right uh, that on certain operational uh, uh, things such as this, the Prime Minister will ask one of his Cabinet members to lead. I can't see anything wrong with that.
I don't think anyone's disputing the fact that it would be, a, you know, a one-man show. Um, but at the same time, Boris Johnson hasn't been seen in public for nine days. When there were floods back in November, he visited the affected areas, he called uh, an emergency committee for the government's COBRA uh, committee. Why do you think it is that he would do those things during an election campaign and not now? Well, what happened on that particular incident in the election is that because it was an election and there were no ministers and we were in what's called a, a perda period where there was less uh, ministerial involvement uh, in the department, there was seen to be uh, something of a slow start in response to that particular incident. And that's why, uh, because of the criticism, the Prime Minister in that instance did stand up uh, Cobra, I think. That's not been necessary this time because we actually have, um, sadly because of the regular occurrence of flood events, we have something called the National Flood Response response centre um, hosted in the cabinet coordinates uh, cross uh, government uh, uh, co coordination and action on these things that's been stood up um, over 10 days now and has been leading all of the response to this so you didn't need to stand up a separate uh, cabinet office uh, infrastructure in the form of cobra because you already had one dedicated to floods that was operating um, you began the interview talking about how extreme weather is going to become more of a, a frequent event can a government really do anything to stop people's homes being flooded? Or is this just an inevitability of the world we're in? Well, it's, uh, I think, inevitable that we're going to get more of these extreme weather events. Of course, uh, we have to do our bit to try to tackle climate change. And as a country, we are. Uh, we've led... It's flooding inevitable. Sorry, we've led the world... Um, well, flooding, um, it, it's uh, the frequency of it, uh, uh, these weather events, of course, is inevitable uh, because uh, we've already got climate change. It's important that we do our bit to mitigate that by leading the world as we are in terms of reducing uh, our carbon emissions and decarbonising our economy. And we're one of the first OECD economies to actually commit to net zero by 2050. But when it comes to flooding, there is uh, more we want to do. And that is why we've committed to spend another £4 billion over the next five years years, particularly looking at some of those nature-based solutions where we can uh, slow down the flow of water, hold water upstream, uh, use uh, soft dams, have natural floodplains so that the water is less likely to get to our urban centres in the first place. But we'll never be able to protect every single home. It's important that we recognise that. But what we can do uh, is do more and more to protect as many homes as possible. OK. Uh, now, the UK is going to, this week, publish its negotiating mandate with uh, the EU for those upcoming trade talks. The negoti negotiating mandate with the US we're expecting the week after. Now, your predecessor in uh, the job, uh, Theresa Villiers, said last month that we will not be importing chlorinated chicken, we will not be importing hormone-treated beef. Will you make the same commitment? Uh, well, look, the uh, truth is that it's already illegal in this country to uh, say it, to sell uh, chlorine washed chicken or indeed uh, hormone beef. That's in our legislation. Um, but the important thing I would say is we believe very passionately in this country about our food standards and our animal welfare standards. We've worked very hard over the last 20 years to uh, build quite a sophisticated market where there's a lot of consumer confidence in the provenance of our food uh, and how it was produced and the safety of our food. Uh, and we're absolutely clear as a government that we will not take risks uh, either with our food standards and that when it comes to animal welfare, uh, we will be uh, projecting our views on animal welfare on the international uh, stage. It's uh, the UK that's been a world leader uh, in animal welfare, particularly farmed animal welfare, and we want to uh, bring the uh, rest of the world along with us. So you said in that answer that it's currently illegal uh, to have chlorinated, treat, chlorinated chicken or hormone-treated beef, but of course, I mean, you've got a big majority, you could change that if you wanted to. So can you give a commitment that even if the US demanded it in a trade deal, it's a red line that we wouldn't cross? Well, I'm not quite sure why the US um, would make such demands because actually uh, chlorine washes on chicken are a very outdated technology and it's not really used by the US anymore anyway. What they tend to use uh, these days are uh, lactic acid washes and we so indeed even in this country will use... Well, um, I, I, I'm, what I'm saying is uh, we won't um, make any moves on our um, standards. We've got a clear 
the position in this country that it is illegal to uh, sell chlorine washed chicken, illegal to sell uh, beef treated with hormones, uh, with no plans to uh, change those things. But equally, as I would say, uh, it's not the case that the US currently use chlorine washed chicken anyway. OK, um, now moving on to immigration, because we've got a bit more uh, guidance on what the post-Brexit immigration policy will look like for uh, this government. And it's all about kind of restricting what the government uh, determines to be kind of low-skilled workers. Of course, uh, one of the uh, sectors that relies heavily on workers from abroad is agriculture. Um, if you restrict the number of workers that comes from abroad, is that not going to hit farmers and basically force people into buying more food from overseas? Well, the government recognises that agriculture is a special case and that's why what we've also announced in the past week is that we're going to quadruple the size of the seasonal agricultural worker scheme to 10,000 initially uh, this year. Uh, it's very important that certain sectors like, such as soft fruit, uh, vegetables and salad production, they're quite uh, reliant on seasonal labour. That's people who come here to work maybe for six months before returning home. And we recognise that's entirely different uh, to people migrating to the UK to settle permanently. That's why uh, a seasonal agricultural worker scheme is important uh, and will be an important part uh, of our um, uh, immigration policy in the future. So you mentioned there that you're quadrupling the number, but that only takes the total to 10,000. I mean, the National Farmers Union says we need 70,000 workers every year. It's nowhere near enough, is it? Well, um, this uh, was 2,500 last year. This is the second year of a pilot and we've increased it to uh, 10,000. Uh, and of course, um, after 70, the completion of that pilot, it's not this year, no, but they don't need 70,000 this year because we still have free movement for the remainder of uh, 2020. And they will be able to recruit the other staff that they need from countries such as Romania and in particular Bulgaria as they do, uh, as they have done in previous years. The important thing will be in the future and obviously the pilot will end this year and we'll be in a position to roll out a fully fledged seasonal agricultural workers scheme that can be designed to provide uh, the needs of the agricultural and horticultural sector. You see, the government says it wants to bring down uh, low-skilled uh, immigration. Many people would see perhaps a more accurate description of that as low-paid uh, jobs rather than low-skilled jobs. Why is it that high-skilled jobs or highly-paid jobs uh, should go to people from overseas, whereas the low-paid ones are reserved for Brits? Well, I think the uh, important thing to recognise here is we want as a country to strike a different course uh, on our immigration policy rather than having what we've had in recent years, which is effectively complete free movement with EU countries uh, and then quite a restricted regime for the rest of the world. It's important that we are consistent and that we have an approach based on skills and that we enable people to come here from uh, wherever they might live if they have the right skills to contribute to our economy. So identifying those areas where we have a skill shortage, whether it might be vets, whether it might be NHS staff, whether it might even be chefs or people who do uh, specialist welding, identifying those types of skills where we have a gap and allowing people to come to work in those sectors is a logical approach rather than having uh, free movement and a complete uh, free-for-all with the European Union. I mean, the Home Secretary said that the kind of lower skill jobs shortages could be filled by the 8.5 million people classed as economically inactive. But according to the Office of National Statistics, most of those people who are economically inactive are students, carers, they've got long-term illnesses or they're retired. Yes, I don't think the Home Secretary was saying that all uh, eight, 8 million of those uh, people uh, would be able to fill these, just that there are people there who might. And uh, I think that's right. There will be some people uh, who perhaps retired but would like to still take a part-time job. There are students, of course, who take a part-time uh, job as well. So um, she's not saying that the, all of those 8 million people uh, can work. Uh, she was saying that there are a pool there of people who could do some. Uh, and I think that's a perfectly legitimate uh, point to make. But a more important point is obviously we're going to keep an eye on all of these things. At the moment, 
there are over 3.2 million EU citizens who've already applied uh, for settled status here in the UK. So they will be staying. So those uh, who are already working here and living here can stay. Uh, and as we uh, look forward, we can then judge uh, what our uh, needs are. At the moment, we don't think there's a need to open a route for so-called uh, low-skilled uh, occupations. But we'll be keeping a very close eye uh, on this and see how things develop over the next couple of years. And the beauty of being outside of the European Union is you have that flexibility as a country uh, to set uh, your immigration policy and to modify it uh, as and when required to ensure that it's fit for purpose. And then just finally, um, you've been in the Department for the Environment before, of course, um, but you've only recently been appointed Environment Secretary. So I'm just quite interested to hear your views on Fox Hunter. Uh, sorry, did you say that again? I, I'm, I'm interested to know your views on fox hunting. A fox hunting? Well, look, as a government, we're not going to change uh, the fox, uh, you know, fox hunting, the, the ban on uh, hunting with dogs. Uh, it's been in place now quite a long time. There's been arguments about it in a number of uh, general elections. Uh, it's always been a free vote issue. And there was a point uh, in history when the Conservatives said that they would uh, offer a uh, free vote on hunting in government time. That's no longer uh, the position. Uh, we think there's a new settlement now on uh, fox hunting that the, uh, the, the ban on hunting with dogs should stay in place. Okay, thank you very much for being on the programme this morning. Thank you. Thank you.